Letter asterisk 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 by the same author Limbo Letter by Aldous Huxley New York George H. Doran Company All Rights Reserved Contents Letter 1 The Birth of God 19 on Hampstead Heath 21 Sympathy 22 Male and Female Created Heathen 23 From the Pillar 24 Jonah 25 Variations on a Theme 26 A Melody by Scarlatti 27 A Sunset 28 Life and Art 30 First Philosopher's Song 31 Second Philosopher's Song 32 Fifth Philosopher's Song 33 Ninth Philosopher's Song 34 Morning Scene 36 Very S 37 Frask 80 S 38 Fatigue 39 The Merry Go Round 40 Back Streets 41 Last Things 42 Gothic 43 Evening Party 44 Beauty 45 Souls Oxidary E.T. Read I Aposunt 55 Leda Leda Brown and Bright as an Agate, Mountain Cool, Eurotas Singing Slips from Pool to Pool, Down Rocky Gullies, Through the Cavernous Pines and Chestnut Groves. Down where the terraced vines and gardens overhang, through valleys grey with olive trees, into a soundless bay of the Aegean. Silent and asleep lie those pools now, but where they dream most deep, men sometimes see ripples of shining hair and the young grace of bodies pale and bare, shimmering far down. The ghosts these mirrors hold of all the beauty they beheld of old, white limbs and heavenly eyes and the hair's river of gold, for once these banks were peopled, Spartan girls loosed here their maiden girdles and their curls, and stooping o'er the level water stole his darling mirror from the sun through whole. Rapturous Hours of Gazing Rapturous hours of gazing. The first star of all this milky constellation, far lovelier than any nymph of wood or green, was she whom Tyndarus had made his queen for her sheer beauty and subtly moving grace, Leda, the fairest of our mortal race. Hymen had lit his torches but one week about her bed and still o'er her young cheek passed rosy shadows of those thoughts that sped across her mind, still virgin, still unwed, for all her body was her own no more, when Leda with her maidens to the shore of bright Eurotas came, to escape the heat of summer noon in waters coolly sweet. By a brown pool which opened smooth and clear below the wrinkled water of a weir they sat them down under an old fir tree to rest, and to the laughing melody of their sweet speech the river's rippling bore a liquid burden, while the sun did pour pure colour out of heaven upon the earth. The meadows seethed with the incessant mirth of grasshoppers seen only when they flew their curves of scarlet or sudden dazzling blue. Within the fir trees round of unpierced shade the maidens sat with laughter and talk, or played, gravely intent, their game of knuckle bones, or tossed from hand to hand the old dry cones littered about the tree. And one did sing a ballad of some far-off Spartan king, who took a wife, but left her, well away, slain by his foes upon their wedding day. That was a piteous story led aside, to be a widow ere she was a bride. Better said one, to live a virgin life alone, and never know the name of wife and bear the ugly burden of a child and have great pain by it. Let me live wild, a bird untamed by man. Nay cried another, I would be wife, if I should not be mother. Cypris I honour, let the vulgar pay their gross vows till you seen her when they pray. Our finer spirits would be blunted quite by bestial teeming, but love's rare delight wings the rapt soul towards Olympus' height. 
delight, cried Leda. Love to me has brought nothing but pain and a world of shameful thought. When they say love is sweet, the poets lie, tease but a trick to catch poor maidens by. What are their boasted pleasures? I am queen to the most royal king the world has seen, therefore I should, if any woman might, know at its full that exquisite delight. Yet these few days since I was made a wife have held more bitterness than all my life, while I was yet a child. The great bright tears slipped through her lashes. Oh, my childish years! Years that were all my own, too sadly few, when I was happy, and yet never knew how happy till today. Her maidens came about her as she wept, whispering her name, Leda, sweet Leda, with a hundred dear caressing words to soothe her heavy cheer. At last she started up with a fierce pride upon her face. I am a queen she cried, but had forgotten it a while, and you, wenches of mine, you were forgetful too. Undress me. We would bathe ourselves. So proud a queen she stood, that all her maidens bowed in trembling fear and scarcely dared approach to do her bidding. But at last the brooch pinned at her shoulder is undone, the white girdle of silk beneath her breasts untied, the tunic falls about her feet, and she steps from the crocus folds of drapery dazzlingly naked, into the warm sun. Godlike she stood, then broke into a run, leaping and laughing in the light, as though life through her veins coursed with so swift a flow of generous blood and fire that to remain too long in statued queenliness were pain to that quick soul, avid of speed and joy. She ran, easily bounding, like a boy narrow of haunch and slim and firm of breast. Lovelier she seemed in motion than at rest, if that might be, when she was never less, moving or still, than perfect loveliness. At last, with cheeks afire and heaving flank, she checked her race, and on the river's bank stood looking down at her own echoed shape and at the fish that, aimlessly agape, hung midway up their heaven of flawless glass, like angels waiting for eternity to pass. Leda drew breath and plunged, her gasping cry splashed up, the water circled brokenly out from that pearly shudder of dipped limbs, the glittering pool laughed up its flowery brims, and everything, save the poor fish, rejoiced their idiot contemplation of the moist, the cold, the watery, was in a trice ended when Leda broke their crystal paradise. Jove in his high Olympian chamber lay hugely supine, striving to charm away in sleep the long, intolerable noon. But heedless Morpheus still withheld his boon and Jove upon his silk-pavilioned bed tossed wrathful and awake. His fevered head swarmed with a thousand fancies, which forecast delights to be, or savoured pleasures past. Closing his eyes, he saw his eagle swift, headlong as his own thunder, stoop and lift on pinions upward labouring the prize of beauty ravished for the envious skies. He saw again that bright, adulterous pair, trapped by the limping husband unaware, fast in each other's arms, and faster in the snare, and laughed remembering. Sometimes his thought went wandering over the earth and sought familiar places, temples by the sea, cities and islands, here a sacred tree and there a cavern of shy nymphs and there a cavern of shy nymphs. He rolled about his bed, 
in many a rich fold crumpling his Babylonian coverlay, and yawned and stretched. The smell of his own sweat brought back to mind his Libyan desert fane of mottled granite, with its endless train of pilgrim camels, reeking towards the sky ammonian incense to his horned deity, the while their masters worshipped, offering huge teeth of ivory, while some would bring their Ethiop wives, sleek wineskins of black silk gelid and huge from drinking asses' milk through years of tropical idleness, to pray for offspring, whom he ever sent away with prayers unanswered, lest their ebon race might breed and blacken the earth's comely face. Noon pressed on him a hotter, heavier weight. O oh love in idleness! How celibate he felt! Libido like a nemesis scourged him with itching memories of bliss. The satin of imagined skin was sleek and supply warm against his lips and cheek, and deep within soft hair's dishevelled dusk his eyelids fluttered, like a flowery musk the scent of a young body seemed to float faintly about him, close and yet remote for perfume and the essence of music dwell in other worlds among the asphodel of unembodied life. Then all had flown, his dream had melted. In his bed, alone, Jove sweating lay and moaned, and longed in vain to still the pulses of his burning pain. In sheer despair at last he leapt from bed opened the window and thrust forth his head into Olympian ether. One fierce frown rifted the clouds, and he was looking down into a gulf of azure calm, the rack seethed round about, tempestuously black, but the god's eye could hold its angry thunders back. There lay the world, down through the chasmed blue stretched out from edge to edge unto his view, and in the midst, bright as a summer's day at breathless noon, the Mediterranean lay, and ocean round the world's dim fringes tossed his glaucous waves in mist and distance lost, and Pontus and the livid Caspian Sea stirred in their nightmare sleep uneasily. And twixt the seas rolled the wide fertile land, dappled with green and tracts of tawny sand, and rich, dark fallows and fields of flowers aglow and the white, changeless silences of snow, while here and their towns, like a living eye unclosed on earth's blind face, towards the sky glanced their bright conscious beauty. Yet the sight of his fair earth gave him but small delight now in his restlessness its beauty could do naught to quench the fever in his blood. Desire lends sharpness to his searching eyes, over the world his focused passion flies quicker than chasing sunlight on a day of storm and golden April. Far away he sees the tranquil rivers of the east, mirrors of many a strange barbaric feast where UN Hellenic dancing girls contort their yellow limbs, and gibbering masks make sport under the moons of many coloured light that swing their lantern fruitage in the night of overarching trees. To him it seems an alien world, peopled by insane dreams. But these are nothing to the monstrous shapes, not men so much as bastardy of apes that meet his eyes in Africa. Between leaves of grey fungoid pulp and poisonous green, white eyes from black and browless faces stare. Dryads with star flowers in their woolly hair dance to the flaccid clapping of their own black dangling ducks through forests overgrown, plaited with writhing creepers. Horrified. He sees them how they leap and dance, or glide, glimpse after black glimpse of a satin skin, among unthinkable flowers, 
to pause and grin out through a trellis of separating lips, of mottled tentacles barbed at the tips and bloated hands and wattles and red lobes of pendulous gristle and enormous probes of pink and slashed and tasseled flesh. Of pink and slashed and tasseled flesh. He turns northward his sickened sight. The desert burns all life away. Here in the forked shade of twin humped towering dromedaries laid, a few gaunt folk are sleeping, fierce they seem even in sleep, and restless as they dream. He would be fearful of a desert bride as of a brown asp at his sleeping side, fearful of her white teeth and cunning arts. Further, yet further, to the ultimate parts of the wide earth he looks, where Britons go painted among their swamps, and through the snow huge hairy snuffling beasts pursue their prey, fierce men, as hairy and as huge as they. Bewildered furrows deepen the thunderer's scowl, this world so vast, so variously foul, who can have made its ugliness? In what revolting fancy were the forms bego of all these monsters? What strange deity, so barbarously not a Greek, was he who could mismake such beings in his own distorted image? Nay, the Greeks alone were men, in Greece alone were bodies fair, minds comely. In that all but island there, cleaving the blue sea with its promontories, lies the world's hope, the seed of all the glories that are to be, there, too, must surely live she who alone can medicinably give ease with her beauty to the thunderer's pain. Downwards he bends his fiery eyes again, glaring on Hellas. Like a beam of light, his intent glances touch the mountain height with passing flame and probe the valleys deep. Rift the dense forest and the age-old sleep of vaulted antas on whose pebbly floor gallop the loud-hoofed centaurs, and the roar of more than human shouting underground pulses in living palpable waves of sound from wall to wall, until it rumbles out into the air, and at that hollow shout that seems an utterance of the whole vast hill, the shepherds cease their laughter and are still. Cities asleep under the noonday sky stir at the passage of his burning eye, and in their huts the startled peasants blink at the swift flash that bursts through every chink of wattled walls, hearkening in fearful wonder through lengthened seconds for the crash of thunder, which follows not, they are the more afraid. Jove seeks a main. Many a country maid, whose sandaled feet pass down familiar ways among the olives, but whose spirit strays through lovelier lands of fancy, suddenly starts broad awake out of her dream to see a light that is not of the sun, a light darted by living eyes, consciously bright, she sees and feels it like a subtle flame mantling her limbs with fear and maiden shame and strange desire. Longing and terrified, she hides her face, like a new wedded bride who feels rough hands that seize and hold her fast, and swooning falls. The terrible light has passed, she wakes, the sun still shines. The olive trees tremble to whispering silver in the breeze and all is as it was, save she alone in whose days dies this deathless light has shone, for never, never from this day forth will she in earth's poor passion find felicity, or love of mortal man. A god's desire has seared her soul. Naught but the same strong fire can kindle the dead ash to life again, and all her years will be a lonely pain. Many a thousand had he looked upon, thousands of mortals, young and old, but none, virgin, or young Ephebus, 
or the flower of womanhood culled in its full-blown hour, could please the thunderer's sight or touch his mind, the longed-for loveliness was yet to find. Had beauty fled, and was there nothing fair under the moon? The fury of despair raged in the breast of heaven's almighty lord, he gnashed his foamy teeth and rolled and roared in bull-like agony. Then a great calm descended on him, cool and healing balm touched his immortal fury. He had spied young Leda where she stood, poised on the riverside. Even as she broke the river's smooth expanse, Leda was conscious of that hungry glance, and knew it for an eye of fearful power that did so hot and thunderously lower, she knew not whence, on her frail nakedness. Jove's heart held but one thought, he must possess that perfect form or die, possess or die. Unheeded prayers and supplications fly, thick as a flock of birds about his ears, and smoke of incense rises, but he hears naught but the soft falls of that melody which is the speech of Leda, he can see naught but that almost spiritual grace which is her body, and that heavenly face where gay, sweet thoughts shine through, and eyes are bright with purity and the soul's inward light. Have her he must. The teasel fingered burr sticks not so fast in a wild beast's tangled fur as that insistent longing in the soul of mighty Jove. Gods, men, earth, heaven, the whole vast universe was blotted from his thought and naught remained but Leda's laughter, naught but Leda's eyes. Magnified by his lust, she was the whole world now. Have her he must, he must. His spirit worked, how should he gain his end with most deliciousness? What better friend, what counsellor more subtle could he find than lovely Aphrodite, ever kind to hapless lovers, ever cunning, to, in all the tortuous ways of love to do and plan the best? To Paphos then. His will and act were one, and straight, invisible, he stood in Paphos, breathing the languid air by Aphrodite's couch. O oh, heavenly fair she was, and smooth and marvellously young. On Tyrian silk she lay, and purple hung about her bed in folds of fluted light and shadow, dark as wine. Two doves more white even than the white hand on the purple lying like a pale flower wearily dropped, were flying with wings that made an odoriferous stir, dropping faint dews of baccaris and myrrh, musk and the soul of sweet flowers cunningly ravished from transient petals as they die. Two stripling cupids on her either hand stood near with winnowing plumes and gently fanned her hot, love-fevered cheeks and eyelids burning. Another, crouched at the bed's foot, was turning a mass of scattered parchments, vows or plaints or glad triumphant thanks which Venus saints, martyrs and heroes on her altars strewed with bitterest tears or gifts of gratitude. From the pile heaped at Aphrodite's feet the boy would take a leaf, and in his sweet, clear voice would read what mortal tongues can tell in stammering verse of those ineffable pleasures and pains of love, heaven and uttermost hell. Jove hidden stood and heard him read these lines of votive thanks. Cypris, this little silver lamp to thee I dedicate. It was my fellow watcher, shared with me those swift, short hours, when raised above my fate in Sphenura's white arms I drank of immortality. A pretty lamp, and I will have it placed beside the narrow bed of some too chaste sister of virgin Artemis, 
to be a night-long witness of her cruelty. Read me another, boy and Venus bent her ear to listen to this short lament. Cypris, Cypris, I am betrayed. Under the same wide mantle laid I found them, faithless, shameless pair. Making love with tangled hair. Alas the goddess cried, nor god, nor man, nor medicinable balm, nor magic can cast out the demon jealousy, whose breath withers the rose of life, save only time and death. Another sheet he took and read again. Farewell to love, and hail the long, slow pain of memory that backward turns to joy. Oh I have danced enough and enough sung, my feet shall be still now and my voice mute, thine are these withered wreaths, this Lydian flute, Cypris, I once was young. And Pietus Aphrodite wept to think how fadingly upon death's very brink beauty and love take hands for one short kiss, and then the wreaths are dust, the bright-eyed bliss perished, and the flute still. Read on, read on. But ere the page could start, a lightning shone suddenly through the room and they were aware of some great terrible presence looming there. And it took shape, huge limbs, whose every line a symbol was of power and strength divine, and it was Jove. Daughter, I come said he, for counsel in a case that touches me close, to the very life. And he straightway told her of all his restlessness that day and of his sight of Leda, and how great was his desire. And so in close debate sat the two gods, planning their rape, while she, who was to be their victim, joyously laughed like a child in the sudden breathless chill and splashed and swam, forgetting every ill and every fear and all, save only this that she was young, and it was perfect bliss to be alive where suns so goldenly shine, and bees go drunk with fragrant honey wine, and the cicadas sing from morn till night, and rivers run so cool and pure and bright. Stretched all her length, arms under head, she lay in the deep grass, while the sun kissed away the drops that sleeked her skin. Slender and fine as those old images of the gods that shine with smooth-worn silver, polished through the years by the touching lips of countless worshippers, her body was, and the sun's golden heat clothed her in softest flame from head to feet and was her mantle, that she scarcely knew the conscious sense of nakedness. The blue Far hills and the faint fringes of the sky shimmered and pulsed in the heat uneasily, and hidden in the grass, cicadas shrill dizzied the air with ceaseless noise, until a listener might wonder if they cried in his own head or in the world outside. Sometimes she shut her eyelids, and wrapped round in a red darkness, with the muffled sound and throb of blood beating within her brain savoured intensely to the verge of pain her own young life, hoarded it up behind her shuttered lids, until, too long confined, it burst them open and her prisoned soul flew forth and took possession of the whole exquisite world about her and was made a part of it. Meanwhile her maidens played, singing an ancient song of death and birth, seed time and harvest, old as the grey earth, and moving to their music in a dance as immemorial. A numbing trance came gradually over her, as though flake after down a feathered flake of snow had muffled all her senses, drifting deep and warm and quiet. And warm and quiet dot from this all but sleep she started into life again. The sky was full of a strange tumult suddenly 
beating of mighty wings and shrill-voiced fear and the hoarse scream of rapine following near. In the high windlessness above her flew, dazzlingly white on the untroubled blue, a splendid swan, with outstretched neck and wings spread fathom wide, and closely following an eagle, tawny and black. This godlike pair circled and swooped through the calm of upper air, the eagle striking and the white swan still scaping as though by happy miracle the imminent talons. For the twentieth time the furious hunter stooped, to miss and climb a mounting spiral into the height again. He hung there poised, eyeing the grassy plain far, far beneath where the girls' upturned faces were like white flowers that bloom in open places among the scarcely barbed woods. And they breathlessly watched and waited, long he lay, becalmed upon that tideless sea of light, while the great swan with slow and creaking flight went slanting down towards safety, where the stream shines through the trees below with glance and gleam of blue aerial eyes that seem to give sense to the sightless earth and make it live. The ponderous wings beat on and no pursuit, stiff as the painted kite that guards the fruit, afloat o'er or orchards ripe, the eagle yet hung as at anchor, seeming to forget his uncaught prey, his rage unsatisfied. Still, quiet dead and then the quickest eyed had lost him. Like a star unsphered, a stone dropped from the vault of heaven, a javelin thrown, he swooped upon his prey. Down, down he came, and through his plumes with a noise of wind-blown flame loud roared the air. From Leda's lips a cry broke, and she hid her face, she could not see him die her lovely, hapless swan. Her lovely, hapless swan daughter, had she heard, even as the eagle hurtled past, the word that treacherous pair exchanged. Peace cried the swan, peace, daughter. All my strength will soon be gone, wasted in tedious flying, ere I come where my desire earth set its only home. Go said the eagle, I have played my part, roused pity for your plight in Leda's heart, pity the mother of voluptuousness. Go, Father Jove, be happy, for success attends this moment. Attends this moment. On the queen's numbed sense fell a glad shout that ended sick suspense bidding her lift once more towards the light her eyes, by pity closed against a sight of blood and death, her eyes, how happy now to see the swan still safe, while far below, brought by the force of his eluded stroke so near to earth that with his wings he woke a gust whose sudden silvery motion stirred the meadow grass, struggled the sombre bird of rage and rapine. Loud his scream and hoarse with baffled fury as he urged his course upwards again on threshing pinions wide. But the fair swan, not daring to abide this last assault, dropped with the speed of fear towards the river. Like a winged spear, outstretching his long neck, rigid and straight, aimed at where Leda on the bank did wait with open arms and kind. Uplifted eyes and voice of tender pity, down he flies. Nearer, nearer, terribly swift, he sped directly at the queen, then widely spread resisting wings, and breaking his descent gainst his own wind, all speed and fury spent, the great swan fluttered slowly down to rest and sweet security on Leda's breast. Menacingly the eagle wheeled above her, but Leda, like a noble-hearted lover keeping his child beloved from tyrannous harm, stood o'er the swan and, 
with one slender arm imperiously lifted, waved away the savage foe, still hungry for his prey. Baffled at last, he mounted out of sight and the sky was void, save for a single white swan's feather molted from a harassed wing that down, down, with a rhythmic balancing from side to side dropped sleeping on the air. Down, slowly down over that dazzling pair, whose different grace in union was a birth of unimagined beauty on the earth, so lovely that the maidens standing round dared scarcely look. Couched on the flowery ground young Leda lay, and to her side did press the swan's proud arching opulent loveliness, stroking the snow-soft plumage of his breast with fingers slowly drawn themselves caressed by the warm softness where they lingered, loath to break away. Sometimes against their growth ruffling the feathers inlaid like little scales on his sleek neck, the pointed fingernails rasped on the warm, dry, puckered skin beneath, and feeling it she shuddered, and her teeth grated on edge, for there was something strange and snake-like in the touch. He, in exchange, gave back to her, stretching his eager neck, for every kiss a little amorous peck, rubbing his silver head on her gold tresses, and with the nip of horny dry caresses leaving upon her young white breast and cheek and arms the red print of his playful beak. Closer he nestled mingling with the slim austerity of virginal flank and limb his curved and florid beauty, till she felt that downy warmth strike through her flesh and melt the bones and marrow of her strength away. One lifted arm bent o'er her brow, she lay with limbs relaxed, scarce breathing, deathly still, save when a quick. Involuntary thrill shook her sometimes with passing shudderings, as though some hand had plucked the aching strings of life itself, tense with expectancy. And over her the swan shook slowly free the folded glory of his wings, and made a white-walled tent of soft and luminous shade to be her veil and keep her from the shame of naked light and the sun's noonday flame. Hushed lay the earth and the wide, careless sky. Then one sharp sound, that might have been a cry of utmost pleasure or of utmost pain, broke sobbing forth, and all was still again. The birth of God night is a void about me, I lie alone, and water drips, like an idiot clicking his tongue, senselessly, ceaselessly endlessly drips into the waiting silence, grown emptier for this small inhuman sound. My love is gone, my love who is tender and young. O oh smooth warm body! O oh passionate lips! I have stretched forth hands in the dark and nothing found. The silence is huge as the sky, I lie alone, my narrow room a darkness that knows no bound. How shall I fill this measureless deep void that the taking away of a child's slim beauty has made? Slender she is and small, but the loneliness she has left is a night no stars allay, and I am cold and afraid. Long, long ago, cut off from the wolfish pack, from the warm, Immediate touch of friends and mate, lost and alone, alone in the utter black of a forest night, some far off, beast-like man, cowed by the cold indifferent hate of the northern silence, crouched in fear, when through his bleared and suffering mind a sudden tremor of comfort ran, and the void was filled by a rushing wind and he breathed a sense of something friendly and near, and in privation the life of God began. Love, from your loss shall a God be born to fill the emptiness, where once you were, 
with friendly knowledge and more than a lover's will to ease despair. Shall I feed longing with what it hungers after, seeing in earth and sea and air a lover's smiles, hearing a lover's laughter, feeling love everywhere? The night drags on. Darkness and silence grow, and with them my desire has grown, my bitter need. Alas, I know, I know that here I lie alone. On Hampstead Heath beneath the sunlight and blue of all but autumn the grass sleeps goldenly, woodland and distant hill shine through the gauzy air in a dust of golden pollen, and even the glittering leaves are almost still. Scattered on the grass, like a ragman's bundles carelessly dropped, men sleep outstretched or, sprawling, bask in the sun. Here glows a woman's bright dress and here a child is sitting, and I lie down and am one of the sleepers, one like the rest of this tumbled crowd. Do they all, I wonder, feel anguish grow with the calm day's slow decline, longing, as I, for a shattering wind, a passion of bodily pain to be the soul's anodyne. Sympathy the irony of being too. Grey eyes, wide open suddenly, regard me and enquire, I see a face grave and unquiet in tenderness. Heart-rending question of women, never answered, tell me, tell me, what are you thinking of? Oh, the pain and foolishness of love. What can I do but make my old grimace, ending it with a kiss, as I always do? Male and female created heathen diaphenia, drunk with sleep, drunk with pleasure, drunk with fatigue, feels her corridon's fingers creep, ring finger, middle finger, index, thumb, strummingly over the smooth sleek drum of her thorax. Meanwhile Handel's jig turns in corridon's absent mind to Yakahula. She can find no difference in the thrilling touch of one who, now, in everything is godlike. Was there ever such passion as ours? His pianoing gives place to simple arithmetic, simplest constatations, six letters in Nice and three in New, luncheon today cost three and two, in a year. He couldn't calculate 365 times 38, figuring with printless fingers on her living parchment. Corridon. I faint, faint, faint at your dear touch. Say, is it possible to love too much? From the pillar Simeon, the withered stylight sat gloomily looking down upon each roof and skylight in all the seething town. And in every upper chamber, on roofs, where the orange flowers make weary men remember the perfume of long dead hours, he saw the wine-drenched riot of harlots and human beasts, and how celestial quiet was shattered by their feasts. The steam of fetid vices from a thousand lupanas, like smoke of sacrifices, reeked up to the heedless stars. And the saint from his high fastness of purity apart cursed them and their unchasteness, and envied them in his heart. Jonah a cream of phosphorescent light floats on the wash that to and fro slides round his feet enough to show many a pendulous stalactite of naked mucus, whirls and wreaths and huge festoons of mottled tripes and smaller palpitating pipes through which a yeasty liquor seethes. Seated upon the convex mound of one vast kidney, Jonah prays and sings his canticles and hymns making the hollow vault resound God's goodness and mysterious ways, till the great fish spouts music as he swims. Variations on a theme swan, swan, 
Yesterday you were the whitest of things in this dark winter. Today the snow has made of your plumes an unwashed pocket handkerchief, an unwashed pocket handkerchief. Lancashire to Lancashire. Tune of the antique trains long ago, each summer holiday a milestone backwards, backwards, Tenby, Barmouth, and year by year all the different hues of the sea, blue, green and blue. But on this river of muddy jade there swims a yellow swan, and along the bank the snow lies dazzlingly white. A melody by Scarlatti how clear under the trees, how softly the music flows, rippling from one still pool to another into the lake of silence. A sunset over against the triumph and the close, amber and green and rose, of this short day. The pale ghost of the moon grows living bright once more, as the last light ebbs slowly away. Darkening the fringes of these western glories the black phantasmagories of cloud advance with noiseless footing, vague and villainous shapes, wrapped in their ragged fustian capes, of some grotesque romance. But overhead where, like a pool between dark rocks, the sky is green and clear and deep, floats windlessly a cloud with curving breast flushed by the fiery west, in godlike sleep. And in my mind opens a sudden door that lets me see once more a little room with night beyond the window, chill and damp, and one green lighted lamp tempering the gloom, while here within, close to me, touching me, even the memory of my desire shakes me like fear, you sit with scattered hair and all your body bare before the fire is lapped about with rosy flame. But still, here on the lonely hill, I walk alone, silvery green is the moon's lamp overhead, the cloud sleeps warm and red, and you are gone. Life and art you have sweet flowers for your pleasure, you laugh with the bountiful earth in its richness of summer treasure. Where now are your flowers and your mirth? Petals and cadenced laughter, each in a dying fall, droop out of life, and after is nothing, they were all. But we from the death of roses that three suns perfume and gild with a kiss, till the fourth discloses a withered wreath, have distilled the fullness of one rare file whose nimble life shall outrun the circling shadow on the dial, outlast the tyrannous sun. First philosopher's song a poor degenerate from the ape, whose hands are four, whose tail's a limb, I contemplate my flaccid shape and know I may not rival him, save with my mind, a nimbler beast possessing a thousand sinewy tails, a thousand hands with which it scales, greedy of luscious truth, the greased poles and the cocoa palms of thought, thrids easily through the mangrove maze of metaphysics, walks the taut frail dangerously on a ways that link across wide gulfs remote analogies between. Tree and tree, outruns the hare, outhopes the goat, mind fabulous, mind sublime and free. But oh, the sound of simian mirth. Mind, issued from the monkey's womb, is still umbilical to earth, earth its home and earth its tomb. Second philosopher's song if, O oh my lesbia, I should commit, not fornication, dear, but suicide, my Thames blown body, plenty vouches it would drift face upwards on the oily tide with the other garbage, till it putrefied. But you, if all your lovers' frozen hearts conspired to send you, desperate, to drown, your maiden modesty would float face down, and men would weep upon your hinder parts. Tease the Lord's doing. 
Marvelous is the plan by which this best of worlds is wisely planned. One law he made for women, one for man, we bow the head and do not understand. Fifth philosopher's song a million million spermatozo, all of them alive, out of their cataclysm but one poor Noah dare hope to survive. And among that billion minus one might have chanced to be Shakespeare, another Newton, a new Dunn, but the one was me. Shame to have ousted your betters thus, taking ark while the others remained outside. Better for all of us, fraud homunculus, if you'd quietly died. Ninth philosopher's song God's in his heaven, he never issues, wise man, to visit this world of ours. Unchecked the cancer gnaws our tissues, stops to lick chops and then again devours. Those find who most delight to roam mid castles of remotest Spain, that there's, thank heaven, no place like home, so they set out upon their travels again. Beauty for some provides escape, who gain a happiness in eyeing the gorgeous buttocks of the ape or autumn sunsets exquisitely dying and some to better worlds than this mount up on wings as frail and misty as passion's all too transient kiss, though afterwards, oh, omnanimal triste. But I, too rational by half to live but where I bodily am, can only do my best to laugh, can only sip my misery dram by dram, while happier mortals take to drink, a dolorous dipsomaniac, fuddled with grief I sit and think, looking upon the bile when it is black. Then brim the bowl with atrabilious liquor. We'll pledge our empire vast across the flood, for blood, as all men know, than waters thicker, but waters wider, thank the Lord, than blood. Morning seen light through the latticed blind spans the dim intermediate space with parallels of luminous dust to gild a nuptial couch, where Goya's mind conceived those agonizing hands, that hair scattered, and half a sunlit bosom bare, and, imminently above them, a red face fixed in the imbecile earnestness of lust. There is here. Every winter's night at eight, Epicurus lies in state, two candles at his head and two candles at his feet. A few choice spirits watch beneath the vault of his dim chapel, where default of music fills the pregnant air with subtler requiem and prayer than ever an organ wrought with notes spouted from its tubal throats. Black Ethiopia's holy child, the cradled bottle, breathes its mild meek spirit on the ravished nose, the palate and the tongue of those who piously partake with me of this funereal agape. Frascati's bubble-breasted swells the dome of this my spiritual home, from whose nave the chandelier, scaphosen frozen, tumbles sheer. We in the round balcony sit. Lean o'er and look into the pit where feed the human bears beneath, champing with their gilded teeth. What negroid holiday makes free with such priapic revelry? What songs? What gongs? What nameless rites? What gods like wooden stalagmites? What steam of blood or kidney pie? What blasts of barn to melody? Ragtime. But when the wearied band swoons to a waltz, I take her hand. And there we sit in blissful calm, quietly sweating palm to palm. Fatigue the mind has lost its Aristotelian elegance of shape, 
there is only a darkness where bubbles and inconsequent balloons float up to burst their luminous cheeks and vanish. A woman with a basket on her head, a Chinese lantern quite askew, the vague bright bulging of chemist's window bottles, and then in my ears the distant noise of a great river of people. And phrases, phrases, it is only a question of saddlebags, Stain Street and Gondibut, falls in Iceland, or was it falls in Aspic? As that small reddish devil turns away with an insolent jut of his hind quarters, I become aware that his curling pug's tail is an electric bell push. But that does not disquiet me so much as the sight of all these polished statues twinkling with highlights and all of them grotesque and all of them colossal. The merry-go-round the machine is ready to start. The symbolic beasts grow resty, curveting where they stand at their places in the great blue circle of the year. The showman's voice rings out. Montez, mes dames it messieurs, Montez. You, sir, must bestride the ram. You will take the scorpion. Yours, madam, is the goat. As for you there, black guard boy, you must be content with the fishes. I have allotted you the virgin, mademoiselle. Polisson. Pardon, pardon. Evidement, sailor sagittaire question on demandi. Oe, les darts. The rest must take what comes. The twins shall counterpoise one another in the scales. So, so. Now away we go, away. Ha, what keen air. Wind of the upper spaces. Snuff it deep, drink in the intoxication of our speed. Hark how the music swells and rings. Sfri music, music of every vagabond planet, every rooted star, sound of winds and seas and all the simmering millions of life. Moving. Singing so with a roar and a rush round we go and round, forever whirling on a ceaseless bank holiday of drunken life and speed. But I happened to look inwards among the machinery of our roundabout, and there I saw a slobbering cretin grinding at a wheel and sweating as he ground, and grinding eternally. And when I perceived that he was the author of all our speed and that the music was of his making, that everything depended on his grinding wheel, I thought I would like to get off. But we were going too fast. Back streets, back streets, gutters of stagnating darkness where men breathe something that is not so much air as a kind of rarefied slime. I look back down the tunneled darkness of a drain to where, at the mouth, a broader, windier waterway glitters with the gay speed and motion of sunlit life. But around all is dimly rotting, and the inhabitants are those squamous, phosphorescent creatures that darkness and decay beget. Little men sheathed tightly in clothes of an exaggeratedly fashionable cheapness, hurry along the pavements, jaunty and at the same time furtive. There is a thin layer of slime over all of them. And then there are the eyes of the women, with their hard glitter that is only of the surface. They see acutely, but in a glassy, superficial way taking in the objects round them no more than my western windows retain the imprint of the sunset that enriches them. Back streets, exhalations of a difficulty puberty, I once lived on the fringes of them. Last things there have been visions, dark in the minds of men, 
death and corruption dancing across the secular abyss that separates eternity from time to where sits the ineluctable judge, waiting, waiting through the ages, and ponders all his predestinated decrees. There will be judgment, and each, in an agony of shame, reluctant yet compelled, will turn his own accuser. 4. Tunctur gestinoxia secreta quoc terpia vidbunt mil milia viraram circumstantia. There under the unwinking gaze of all the legions of just men made perfect, the poor prisoner will uncover each dirty secret of his heart, will act over again each shameful scene of his life. And those eyes of saints and angels will shine impassively down upon his beastliness, and to him, as he looks at their steady brilliance, they will seem a million of little blazing loopholes slotted in the walls of hell. Hildebert, this was your vision as you brooded over death and judgment, hell and heaven, in your cloister, a thousand years ago. Do you not envy us our peace of mind who know not four ultimates, but only one? For whom the first of the last things is also the last, us, whom death annihilates with all our shame and all our folly, leaving no trace behind. Gothic sharp spires pierce upwards, and the clouds are full of tumbling bells. Reckless breakneck, head over heels down an airy spiral of stairs run the bells. Upon Paul's steeple stands a tree. Up again and then once more to the bottom, two steps at a time. As full of apples as can be. Up again and down again, centuries of climbing have not worn the crystal smoothness of the degrees. Along the bellying clouds the little boys of London town come running, running as best they may, seeing that at every step they sink ankle-deep through the woolly surface into the black heart of thunder beneath. The apples on the trees are swaying in the wind, rocking to the clamour of bells. The leaves are of bright green copper, and rattle together with a scaly sound. At the roots of the tree sit four gargoyles playing a little serious game with dice. The hunchbacked ape has won from the manticore that crooked French crown with a hole in it which the manticore got from the friar with the strawberry nose, he had it in turn as an arms from the grave knight who lies with crossed legs down there, through the clouds and the dizzy mist of bell ringing where the great church is a hollow ship, full of bright candles, and stable in the midst of dark tempestuous seas. Evening party song Espoi, song Espoi sang the lady while the piano laboriously opened its box of old sardines in treacle. One detected tomain in the syrup. Song Espoi. I thought of the rhymes. Swa, non shalloy, reaper swa, the dying falls of a symbolism grown sadly suicidal before the broad Flemish back of the singer, the due lapse of her audience. Song Espoi The listeners wore the frozen rapture of those who gaze upon the uplifted host. Catching one another's eye, we had a simultaneous vision of pews of hyenas and hysteria. Three candles were burning. They behaved like English aristocrats in a French novel, perfectly, impassively. I tried to imitate their my lordliness. One of the candles flickered, snickered. Was it a draught or was it laughter? Flickering, snickering, Candles, you betrayed me. I had to laugh too. Beauty I there is a sea somewhere, whether in the lampless crypts of the earth, 
or among sunlit islands, or that which is an unfathomable and terrifying question between the archipelagos of stars, there is a sea, and perhaps its tides have filled those green transparent pools that glint like eyes in a spring storm cloud, which is forever troubled and in travail a bubbling and a heaving up of waters as though for the birth of a fountain. The sick and the crippled lie along the brims in expectation of the miracle. And at last, at last, a funnel of white water is twisted up and so stands, straight and still by the very speed of its motion. It drinks the light, slowly it is infused with color rose and mother of pearl. Slowly it takes shape, a heavenly body. O oh dazzling Anadio Min! The flakes of foam break into white birds about her head, fall again in a soft avalanche of flowers. Perpetual miracle, beauty endlessly born. Two steamers. In all your traveling have you trailed the meshes of your long expiring white nets across this sea, or dipped in it your sliding rail, or balanced your shadow far far down upon its glass green sand? Or, forgetting the preoccupations of commerce and the well-oiled predestination of your machinery, did you ever put in at the real pathos? Three in the city of Troy whither our argonautical voyages had carried us, we found Helen and that lamentable Cresside who was to Chaucer the feminine paradox, untenably fantastic but so devastatingly actual, the crystal ideal, flawed, and to Shakespeare the inevitable trull, flayed to show her physiological machinery and the logical conclusion of every the most heartrendingly ingenuous gesture of maidenhood. But, bless you, our gorge doesn't rise. We are cynically well up in the damning theory of women, which makes it all the more amusing to watch ourselves in the ecstatic practice of her. Unforeseen perversity. Fabulous Helen. At her firm breasts they used to mould delicate drinking cups which made the sourest vinegar richly poisonous. The geometry of her body had utterly outwitted Euclid, and the philosophers were baffled by curves of a subtlety infinitely more elusive and Eleusinian than the most oracular speculations of Parmenides. They did their best to make a coherent system out of the incompatible, but empirically established, facts of her. Time, for instance, was abolished within the circle of her arms. It is eternity when her lips touch me Paris had remarked. And yet this same Paris was manifestly and notoriously falling into a decline had lost whatever sense or beauty he once possessed, together with his memory and all skill in the nine arts which are memory's daughters. How was it then, these perplexed philosophers wondered, that she could at one and the same moment give eternity like a goddess, while she was vampiring away with that divine thirsty mouth of hers the last dregs of a poor mortal life. They sought an insufficient refuge in Heraclitus' theory of opposites. Meanwhile Troilus was always to be found at sunset, pacing up and down the walls by the western gate, quite mad. At dusk the Greek campfires would blossom along Xanthus' banks, one after another, a myriad lights dancing in the dark. As when the moon refulgent lamp of night, o'er heaven's pure azure spreads her something light. He would repeat the simile to himself, but could never remember the correct epithets. Not that they mattered, any more than anything else. 
For there are fine cities in the world, Manhattan, Ekbatana and Hikatompilus, but this city of Troy is the most fabulous of them all. Rome was seven hills of butcher's meat, Athens an abstraction of marble, in Alexandria the steam of kidna puddings revolted the Koanobits, darkness and size render London inappreciable, Paris is full of sparrows, the snow lies gritty on Berlin, Moscow has no verisimilitude, all the east is peopled by masks and apes and larvae. But this city of Troy is most of all real and fabulous with its charnel beauty. Is not Helen the end of our search, paradisal little world, symbol and epitome of the great? Dawn sleeps in the transparent shadow of roses within her ear. The stainless candor of infinity, far off peaks in summer and the Milky Way has taken marvellous form in her. The little world has its meteors, too, comets and shadowy clouds of hair, stars at whose glance men go planet-struck. Meteors, yes, and history it has. The past is still alive in the fragrance of her hair, and her young body breathes forth memories as old as the beginning of life. Arrows first of gods. In her is the goal. I rest here with Helen. Fool I said, quote your Faustus. I go further. V further, but a hundred Lilliputian tethers prevent me, the white nerves which tie soul to skin. And the whole air is aching with epidermical magnetism. Further, further. But Troy is the birthplace of my homesickness. Troy is more than a patriotism, for it is built of my very flesh, the remembrance of it is a fire that sticks and tears when I would pull it off. But further. One last look at Troilus where he stands by the western gate, staring over the plain. Further. When I have learned the truth, I will return and build a new palace with domes less ominously like breasts, and there I will invent a safer Helen and a less paradoxical Cresside, and my harem will be a library for enlightenment. Six here are pagodas of diminishing bells. The leopard sleeps in the depth of his rosy cavern and when he breathes it is a smell of irresistible sweetness, in the bestiaries he is the symbol of Christ in his sepulchre. This listening conch has collected all the rumors of pantheism, the dew in this veined cup is the sacrament of nature, while these pale theoribals worship in the dark with yellow lamps and incense. Everywhere alchemical profusion, the golden mintage of glades and ripples, vigils of passion enriched with silver under the fingers of the moon, everywhere lavishness, color, music, the smoothness of machinery, incredible and fantastic ingenuities. God has lost his half-hunter in the desert. But we have not come to worship among these gothic beaches for all their pillars and the lace work of their green windows. We are looking for other things than churches. Seven trees, the half-fossilized exuberances of a passionate life, petrified fountains of intemperance, with their abolition begins the realm of reason. Geometry, lines and planes, smooth edges, the ordered horror of perspectives. In this country there are pavements bright and sleek as water. The walls are precipices to which giants have nailed a perpetual cataract of marble. The fringes of the sky are scalloped with a pattern of domes and minarets. At night, too, 
the downstruck lamps are pyramids of phantom green and the perfect circle they make upon the pavement is magical. Look over the parapet of the Acropolis. The bridges go dizzily down on their swaying catenaries, the gull's flight chained fast. The walls drop clear into the valley, all the millions of basalt blocks calcined into a single red monolith, fluted with thirstily shining organ pipes, which seem forever wet. There are no crevices for moss and toad flax, and even the claws of the yellow lichen slip on its polished flanks. The valley is all paved and inlaid with rivers of steel. No trees, for they have been abolished. Glorious unnature cries the watcher at the parapet. His voice launches into the abyss, following the curve of the bridges. Glorious unnature. We have triumphed. But his laughter as it descends is like a flight of broken steps. Eight let us abandon ourselves to time, which is beauty's essence. We live among the perpetual degenerations of apotheoses. Sunset dissolves into soft grey snow and the deep ocean of midnight boundless as forgetfulness or some yet undiscovered Pacific, contracts into the green puddle of the dawn. The flowers burn to dust with their own brightness. On the banks of ancient rivers stand the pitiful stumps of huge towers and the ghosts of dead men straining to return into life. The woods are full of the smell of transience. Beauty, then, is that moment of descent when apotheosis tilts its wings downwards into the gulf. The ends of the curve lose themselves parabolically somewhere in infinity. Our sentimental eyes see only the middle section of this degeneration, knowing neither the upper nor the lower extremes, which some have thought to meet, Godhead and annihilation. Old curiosity shops. If I have said mortality is beauty it was a weakness. The sense of time is a symptom of anemia of the soul, through which flows angelic itcher. We must escape from the dust of the shop. Cloistered darkness and sleep offer us their lotuses. Not to perceive where all is ugly eaten into by the syphilis of time, heart-sickening, this is beauty, not to desire where death is the only consummation, wisdom. Night is a measureless deep silence, daybreak brings back the fetid gutters of the town. O supreme beauty of a night that knows no limitations, stars or the jagged edges of cock crowing. Desperate. My mind has desired it, never my blood, whose pulse is a rhythm of the world. At the other extreme, Beatrice lacks solidity, is as unresponsive to your kisses as mathematics. She too is an oubliette, not a way of life, an oubliette that, admittedly, shoots you upwards into light, not down to death but it comes to the same thing in the end. What, then, is the common measure? To take the world as it is, but metaphorically, informing the chaos of nature with a soul, qualifying transience with eternity. When flowers are thoughts, and lonely poplars fountains of aspiring longing, when our actions are the poem of which all geographies and architectures and every science and all the unclassed individual odds and ends are the words, when even Helen's white voluptuousness matches some candor of the soul, then it will have been found, the permanent and living loveliness. It is not a far-fetched, dear-bought gem, 
no commander to be smelt only when the crowd becomes too stinkingly insistent. It is not a birth of rare oboes or violins, not visible only from ten to six by state permission at a nominal charge, not a thing richly apart, but an ethic, a way of belief and of practice, of faith and works, medieval in its implication with the very threads of life. I desire no Paphian cloister of pink monks, rather a rosy brotherhood of common life, eating, drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, taking and taken in adultery, reading, thinking, and when thinking fails, feeling immeasurably more subtly, sometimes perhaps creating. Arduous search for one who is chained by his desires to dead carcasses, whose eyes are dimmed with tears by the slow heart-breaking twilights full of old family ghosts laid in lavender, whose despair cries out for opiate and anodyne, craving gross sleep or a place on the airy unsupported pinnacles which hang in the sterile upper chambers of ether. Venter Aetera Head in air, your centaurs are your only poets. Their hoofs strike sparks from the flints and they see both very near and immensely far. Souls oxidere et redia possunt forward John Ridley. The subject of this poem was killed in February 1918. If I should perish he wrote to me only five weeks before his death. If I should perish, and one isn't exactly a good life at the moment, I wish you'd write something about me. It isn't vanity, for I know you'll do me, if anything, rather less than justice, not vanity, I repeat, but that queer irrational desire one has for immortality of any kind, however short and precarious, for frankly, my dear. I doubt whether your verses will be so very much more perennial than brass. Still, there'll be something. One can't, of course, believe in any ordailer for one's personal self, one would have first to believe in some kind of a friendly god. And as for being a spiritualist spook, one of those wretched beings who seem to spend their eternity in trying to communicate with the earth by a single telephone, where the number is always engaged, and the line chronically out of order, well, all I can say is, heaven preserve me from such a future life. No, my only hope is you, and a damned poor guarantee for eternity. Don't make of me a khaki image, I beg. I'd rather you simply said of me, as Erasmus did of his brother, strenuous compotter, NEC scortator ignavus. I sincerely hope, of course, that you won't have to write the thing at all, hope not, but have very little doubt you will. Goodbye. The following poem is a tentative and provisional attempt to comply with his request. Ridley was an adolescent, and suffered from that instability of mind produced by the mental conflict forced upon man by his sensitiveness to heard suggestion on the one hand and to experience on the other. I quote from Mr. Trotter's memorable work on herd instinct that characteristic instability which makes adolescence so feebly skeptical, so inefficient, so profoundly unhappy. I have fished up a single day from Ridley's forgotten existence. It has a bedraggled air in the sunlight, this poor wisp of lethean weed. Fortunately, however, it will soon be allowed to drop back into the water where we shall all, in due course, join it. The greater part must be content to be as though they had not been. 
I between the drawing of the blind and being aware of yet another day there came to him behind close, pregnant eyelids, like a flame of blue, intense, untroubled by the wind, a Mediterranean bay, bearing a brazen beak and foamless oars to wear, marmorially smooth and bright. The steps soar up in one pure flight from the sea's edge to the palace doors, that have shut, have shut their valves of bronze, and the windows to our lifeless eyes. The galley grated on the stone, he stepped out, and was alone, no white-sailed hopes, no clouds, nor swans to shatter the ocean's calm, to break the skies. Up the slow stairs, up the slow stairs did he know it was a dream. First one foot up, then the other foot, shuddering like a mandrake root that hears the truffle dog at work and draws a breath to scream, to moan, to scream. To moan, to scream. The gates swing wide, and it is coolly dark inside, and corridors stretch out and out joining the ceilings to their floors, and parallels ring wedding bells and through a hundred thousand doors perspective has abolished doubt. But one of the doors was shut, and behind it the subtlest lutenist was shaking a broken necklace of tinkling notes, and somehow it was feminine music. Strange exultant fear of desire, when hearts beat brokenly. He laid his hand on the latch, and woke among his familiar books and pictures, real as his dream. He wondered. 10 to 9. Thursday. Wasn't he lunching at his aunt's? Distressing circumstance. But then he was taking Jenny out to dine, which was some consolation. What a chin! Civilized ten thousand years, and still no better way than rasping a pale mask with imminent suicide, steel or obsidian, repulsive task. And the more odious for being quotidian. If one should live till eighty-five. And the dead, do they still shave? The horrible dead, are they alive? But that lute, playing across his dream. Quick drops breaking the sleep of the water wheel, song and ebbing whisper of a summer stream, music's endless inconsequence that would reveal to souls that listened for it, the all unseizable confidence, the mystic rose, could it but find the magical fall that droops, droops and dies into the perfect close. And why so feminine? But one could feel the unseen woman sitting there behind the door, making her ceaseless slow appeal to all that prowls and growls in the caves beneath the libraries and parlors of the mind. If only one were rational, if only at least one had the illusion of being so. Nine o'clock. Still in bed. Warm but how lonely. He wept to think of all those single beds, those desperate night-long solitudes, those mental salons full of nudes. Shelley was great when he was twenty-four. Eight thousand nights alone, minus, perhaps, six, or no. Seven, certainly not more. Five little bits of heaven, tum de rum, de rum, de rum, five little bits of heaven and one that was a lapse, high priced disgust, it stopped him suddenly in the midst of laughter and talk with a tingling down the, like infant's impoliteness, a terrible infant's brightness, and he would shut his eyes so as not to see his own hot blushes calling him a swine. Atrocious memory. For memory should be of things secure and dead, being past, 
not living and disquieting. At last he threw the nightmare of his blankets off. Cloudy ammonia, camels in your bath, the earth earth bubbles as the water earth, he was not of them, too, too solidly always himself. What foam of kissing lips, pouting, parting with the ghost of the seven sips one smacks for he coughs. One smacks for he coughs, pitiable to be quite so deplorably naked when one strips. There was his scar, a panel of old rose slashed in the elegant buff of his trunk hose, a dong is punctured by his amorous bore, permanent souvenir of the Great War. One of God's jokes, typically good, that wound of his. How perfect that he should have suffered it for, what? 2 the dear front page of the Times. Chronicle of essential history, marriage, birth, and the sly mysteriousness of lovers' greetings, of lovers' meetings, and dirty death, impartially paid to courage and the old decade. But nobody had been born today. Nobody married that he knew, nobody died and nobody even killed, he felt a little aggrieved, nobody even killed. But, to make up, Tuesday, Colchester train, wanted brown eyes address, with a view to meeting again. Dear brown eyes, it had been nice of her to talk so friendly to a lonely traveller. Why is it nobody ever talks to me? And now, here was a letter from Helen. Better to open it rather than thus dwell in a long muse and maze over the scrawled address and the postmark, staring stupidly. Love, was there no escape? Was it always there, always there? The same huge and dominant shape like Windsor Castle leaning over the plain, and the letter of Vista cut through the musing forest, at the end the old round tower, singing its refrain, here we are, here we are, here we are again. The life so short, so vast love science and art, so many conditions of felicity. Darling, will you become a part of my poor physiology? And, my beloved, may I have the latch key of your history. And while this corpse is what it is dear, we must share geographies. So many conditions of felicity. And now time was a widening gulf and space, a fixed between, and fate still kept them apart. Her voice quite gone, distance had blurred her face. The life so short, so vast love science and art. So many conditions, and yet, once, four whole days, four short days of perishing time, they had fulfilled them all. But that was long ago, ah. Long ago, like the last horse bus, or the Christmas pantomime, or the bells, oh, the bells of Edgar Allan Poe. 3. Helen, your letter, proving, I suppose, that you exist somewhere in space, who knows. Somewhere in time, perhaps, arrives this morning, reminding me with a note of Lutheran warning that faith's the test, not works. Works, any fool can do them if he tries to. But what school can teach one to credit the ridiculous, the palpably non-existent? So with us, votaries of the copulative cult, in this affair of love, quick and whoever would be saved, must love without adjunct of sense or reason, must not doubt although the deity be far removed, remote, invisible who is not loved best by voluptuous works, 
but by the faith that lives in absence and the body's death. I have no faith, and even in love remain agnostic. Are you here? The fact is plain, constated by the heavenly vision of you, maybe by the mouth's warm touch, and that I love you, I then most surely know, most painfully. But now you've robbed the temple, leaving me a poor invisibility to adore, now that, alas, you're vanished, gone no more, you take my drift. I only ask your leave to be a little unfaithful, not to you, my dear, to whom I was and will be true, but to your absence. Hence no cause to grieve, for absence may be cheated of a kiss, lightly and laughing, with no prejudice to the so longed-for presence, which some day will crown the presence of will crown the presence of La Vostage as dear unhappy Troilus would say, dot. For oh, the maggots, the maggots in his brains. Words, words and words. A birth of rhymes and the strangest, the most unlikely superfetations, new deep thoughts bego by a jingle upon a pun, new worlds glimpsed through the window of a word that has ceased, somehow to be opaque. All the muses buzzing in his head. Autobiography crystallized under his pen, thus, when I was young enough not to know youth, I was a fawn whose loves were Byzantine among stiff trees. Before me naked truth creaked on her intellectual legs, divine in being inhuman, and was never caught by all my speed for she could outrun thought. Now I am old enough to know I am young, I chase more plastic beauties, but inspire life in their clay, purity in their dung with the creative breath of my desire. And utter truth is now made manifest when on a certain sleeping face and breast the moonlight dreams and silver cords are strung and a god's hand touches the aching lyre. He read it through, a pretty, clinquant thing, like bright spontaneous bird song in the spring, instinct with instinct, full of dewy freshness. Yes, he had genius, if he chose to use it, if he chose to, but it was too much trouble, and he preferred reading. He lit his pipe, opened his book, plunged in and soon was drowned in pleasant seas to rise again and find one o'clock struck and his unshaven face still like a record in a musical box, and Auntie Lou miles off in Bloomsbury. V I the open sesame of Master John and then the broad silk bosom of Aunt Lou. Dear John, this is a pleasure. How are you? Well, thanks. Where's Uncle Will? Your uncle's gone to Bath for his lumbago. He gets on as well as anyone can hope to do at his age, for you know he's seventy-two, but still, he does his bit. He sits upon the local tribunal at home and takes parties of wounded soldiers out in breaks to see the country. And three times a week he still goes up to business in the city, and then, sometimes, at night he has to speak in village halls for the War Aims Committee too. Well, have you any news about the war? What do they say in France? I daren't repeat the things they say. You see we've got some meat for you, dear John. Really, I think before today I've had no lamb this year. We score by getting decent vegetables to eat, sent up from home. This is a good receipt, the touch of garlic makes it. Have some more. 
Poor Tom was wounded on the 23rd, did you know that? And just today I heard news from your uncle that his nephew James is dead, Matilda's eldest boy. I knew one of those boys, but I'm so bad at names. Mine had red hair. Oh, now, that must be Hugh three. Colonel McGillicuddy came to dine quietly here, a night or two ago. He's on the staff and very much in the know about all sorts of things. His special line is tanks. He says we've got a new design of super tank, with big guns, that can go, I think he said, at 30 miles or so an hour. That ought to make them whine for peace. He also said, if I remember, that the war couldn't last beyond September, because the Germans' trucks were wearing out and couldn't be replaced. I only hope it's true. You know your uncle has no doubt that the whole thing was plotted by the Pope. Goodbye, dear John. We have had a nice talk. You must soon come again. Goodbye, goodbye. He tottered forth, full of the melancholy that comes of surfeit, and began to walk slowly towards Oxford Street. The brazen sky burned overhead. Beneath his feet the stones were a grey incandescence, and his bones melted within him and his bowels yearned. Six the crowd, the crowd, oh, he could almost cry to see those myriad faces hurrying by, and each a strong tower rooted in the past on dark unknown foundations, each made fast with locks nobody knew the secret of, no key could open, save that perhaps love might push the bars half back and just peep in and see strange sights, it may be. But for him they were locked dungeons, every window bright with beckoning mystery, and then, good night. The lamp was out, they were past, they were gone for ever ever. And one might have been the hero or the friend long sought, and one was the loveliest face his eyes had ever seen, vanished as soon and he went lonely on. Then in a sudden fearful vision he saw the whole world spread before him, a vast sphere of seething atoms moving to one law, be individual. Approach, draw near, yes, even touch, but never join, never be other than your own selves eternally. And there are tangents, tangents of thought that aim out through the gaps between the patterned stars at some fantastic dream without a name that like the moon shining through prison bars, visits the mind with madness. So they fly, those soaring tangents, till the first jet tires, failing, faltering halfway up the sky, and breaks poor slender fountain that aspires against the whole strength of the heavy earth within whose womb, darkly, it took birth. Oh, how remote he walked along the street, jostling with other lumps of human meat. He was so tired. The café doors invite. Caverned within them, still lingers the night in shadowy coolness soothing the seared sight. He sat there smoking, soulless and wholly crass, sunk to the eyes in the warm sodden morass of his own guts, wearily, wearily ruminating visions of mortality, memento mores from the pink alcove, nightmare oppressiveness of profane love. Cesspool within, and without him he could see nothing but mounds of flesh and harlotry. Like a half-prigged bubble pendulous in space, the buttered leatheriness of a Jew's face looms through cigar smoke, red and ghastly white, 
death as headwomen fascinate the sight. It was the nightmare of a corpse. Dead, dead. Oh, to wake up, to live again. He fled from that foul place and from himself. Seven twin domes of the Alhambra, veiled tenderness of the sky above the square, he sat him down in the gardens, under the trees, and in the dust, with the point of his umbrella, drew pictures of the crosses we have to bear. The poor may starve, the sick have horrible pains, but there are pale eyes even in the London plains. Men may make war and money, mischief and love, but about us are colours and the sky above. Yes, here, where the golden domes ring clear, and the plains patiently, hopefully renew their green refrain from year to year to the dim spring burden of London's husky blue, here he could see the folly of it. How? confine a boundless possible within the prison of an ineluctable now. Go slave to pain, woo forth original sin out of her lair, and all by a foolish act. Madness. But now, Wordsworth of Leicester Square, he'd learned his lesson, learned by the mere fact of the place existing so finely unaware of syphilis and the restless in and out of public lavatories, and evening shout of winners and disasters, races and war. Troubles come thick enough. Why call for more by suiting action to the divine word? His spleen was chronic, true but he preferred its subtle agony to the brute force that tugged the barbs of deep-anchored remorse. The sunlight wrapped folds of soft golden silk about him, and the air was warm as milk against his skin. Long sitting still had made cramped soreness such a pleasure, he was afraid to shift his tortured limbs, lest he should mar life's evenness. London's noise from afar smoothed out its harshness to soothe his thoughts asleep, sound that made silence much more calm and deep. The domes of gold, the leaves, emerald bright, were intense, piercing arrows of delight. He did not think, thought was a shallow thing to his deep sense of life, of mere being. He looked at his hand, lying there on his knee, the blue veins branching, the tendons cunningly dancing like jacks in a piano if he shook a knot-boned finger. Only to look and look, till he knew it, each hair and every pore, it seemed enough, what need of anything more. Thought, a blind alley, action which at best is cudgelling water that goes back to rest as soon as you give over your violences. No, wisdom culls the flowers of the five senses, savouring the secret sweetness they afford, instead of which he had a medical board next week, and they would pass him fit. Good Lord. Well, let all pass. Well. Let all pass dot but one must outdo fate, wear clothes more modish than the fashion, run faster than time, not merely stand and wait, do in a flash what cannot be undone through ten eternities. Predestinate. So would God be, that is, if there were one, general epidemic which spoils nobody's fun. Action. Action. Quickly rise and do the most irreparable things, beget, in one brief consummation of the will, remorse, reaction, wretchedness, regret. Action. This was no time for sitting still. He crushed his hat down over his eyes and walked with a stamp to symbolize action, action, left right, left, 
planting his feet with a slabby beat, taking strange Procrustean steps, lengthened, shortened to avoid touching the lines between the stones, a thing which makes God so annoyed. Action, action. First of all he spent three pounds he couldn't afford in buying a book he didn't want, for the mere sake of having been irrevocably extravagant. Then feeling very bold, he pressed the bell of a chance house, it might disclose some new Arabian night behind its grimy husk, who knows. The seconds passed, all was dead. Arrogantly he rang once more. His heart thumped on sheer silence, but at last there was a shuffling, something behind the door became approaching panic, and he fled. Eight misery he said, to have no chin, nothing but brains and sex and taste, only omissively to sin, weakly kind and cowardly chaste. But when the war is over, I will go to the east and plant tea and rubber, and make much money. I will eat the black sweat of niggers and flagellate them with whips. I shall be enormously myself, incarnate chin. The anguish of thinking ill of oneself, Saint Paul's religion, poignant beyond words turns ere you know it to faint minor thirds before the ritualistic pomps of the world, the glass grey silver of rivers, silken skies unfurled, urim and thummim of dawn and sunsetting, and the lawn sleeves of a great episcopal cloud, matins of song and vesperal murmuring, incense of night long flowers and earth new ploughed all beauties of sweetness and all that shine or sing. Conscience is smoothed by beauty's subtle fingers into voluptuousness, where nothing lingers of bitterness, saving a sorrow that is rather a languor than a sense of pain. So, from the tunnel of St. Martin's Lane sailing into the open square, he felt his self-reproach. His good resolutions melt into an ecstasy, gentle as balm, before the spire, etched black and white on the calm of a pale windless sky, street martin's spire, and the shadows sleeping beneath the portico and the crowd hurrying, ceaselessly, to and fro. Alas, the bleached and slender tower that aches upon the gauzy sky where blueness breaks into sweet hoarseness, veiled with love and tender as the dove's voice alone in the woods, too slender, too finely penciled, black and bleaching white on smoky mist, too clear in the keen light of utmost summer, and oh! The lives that pass in one swift stream of colour, too, too bright, too swift, and all the lives unknown, alone. Alas! A truce to summer and beauty and the pain of being too consciously alive among the things that pass and the things that remain, oh, equal sadness, the pain of being young. Truce, truce! Once again he fled, all his life, it seemed, was a flight fled and found sanctuary in a cinema house. Huge faces loomed and burst, like bubbles in a black wind. He shut his eyes on them and in a little slept, slept, while the pictures passed and returned, passed once more and returned. And he, like God in the midst of the wheeling world, slept on, and when he woke it was eight o'clock. Jenny. Revenge is sweet, he will have kept dear Jenny waiting. Nine tall straight poplars stand in a meadow, the wind and sun caress them, dappling the deep green grass with shine and shadow, 
and a little apart one slender sapling sways in the wind and almost seems conscious of its own supple grace, and shakes its twin-hued leaves and gleams with silvery laughter, filling the place where it stands with a sudden flash of human beauty and grace, till from her tree steps forth the dryad, now turned woman, and sways to meet him. It is she. Food and drink, food and drink, olives as firm and sleek and green as the breasts of a sea god's daughter, swimming far down where the corpses sink through the dense shadowy water. Silver and black on flank and back, the glossy sardine mourns its head. The red anchovy and the beetroot red, with carrots, build a gorgeous stair, bronze apoplexy and venetian hair, and the green pallor of the salad round sharpens their clarion sound. De lady take hors d'oeuvre. And de gentleman too. Padieu. Dieu. Echo answers, do. So, Jenny, you've found another perfect man. Perfect, perhaps but not so sweet as you, not such a baby. Me. A baby. Why, I am older than the rocks on which I sit. Oh, how delightful, talking about oneself. Golden wine, pale as a Tuscan primitive, and wine's strange taste, half loathsome, half delicious, come, my lesbia. Let us love and live. What though the mind still think that one thing's vicious more than another? If the thought can give this wine's rich savour to our laughing kiss, let us preserve the Christian prejudice. Oh, there are shynesses and silences, shynesses and silences. But luckily God also gave us wine. Jenny, adorable, what draws the line at the mere word love? Has anyone the right to look so lovely as you look tonight, to have such eyes, such a helmet of bright hair? But candidly, he wondered, do I care? He heard her voice and himself spoke, but like faint light through a cloud of smoke, there came unreal and far away, mere sounds utterly empty, like the drone of prayers, cramp repetita, prayers and praise, long, long ago, in the old school chapel days, senseless, but so intrusive on one's own interior life one couldn't even think. Oh sweet, rare, perilous, wretchy drink. Another glass. X how cool is the moonless summer night, how sweet after the noise and the dizzy choking heat. The bloodless lamps look down upon their own green image in the polished roadway throne, and onward and out of sight the great road runs, smooth and dark as a river of calm bronze. Freedom and widening space, his life expands, ready, it seems to burst the iron bands of self, to fuse with other lives and be not one but the world, no longer I but she. See, like the dolorous memory of happy times in misery, an aged handsome fills the street with the superannuated beat of hollow hoofs and bells that chime out of another quieter time. Good night the last kiss, and God bless you my dear. So, she was gone, she who had been so near, so breathing warm, soft mouth and hands and hair, a moment since. Had she been really there, close at his side, and had he kissed her? It seemed unlikely as something somebody else had dreamed and talked about at breakfast, being a bore, improbable unsubstantial, dim, 
yet more real than the rest of life, real as the blaze of a sudden scene picture, as the lightning phrase with which the poet gods strangely create their brief bright world beyond the reach of fate. Yet he could wonder now if he had kissed her or his own loved thoughts. Did she exist now she was history and safely stowed down in the past? There, with a conscious smile, they let her rest eternal. And meanwhile, lamp fringed towards meeting parallels, the road stretched out and out, and the old weary horse, come from the past, went jogging his homeward course uphill through time to some demoded place, on ghostly hoofs back to the safe has been, but fact returns insistent as remorse, uphill towards Hampstead, back to the year of grace 1917. 11 between the drawing of the blind and being aware of yet another day. Printed by Morrison and Gibb Limited, Edinburgh transcriber notes misspelled words and printer errors have been corrected. Inconsistencies in punctuation have been maintained. A cover was created for this ebook. The End of Letter, by Aldous Huxley. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook letter asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the foundation and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start. Full license the full project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works by using or distributing this work or any other work associated in any way with the phrase project Gutenberg. You agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1 General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1.0 by reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, 
trademark forward slash copyright agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.e.1 The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed 
This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 Do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license terms from this work or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 
1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.e.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty Disclaimer of Damages except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work under this agreement. Disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, 
strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. A. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. B alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, and, c, any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Project Gutenberg trademark symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg trademark symbol S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. 
In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501c3 educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's sign or federal tax identification number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, UT 84116, 801-596-1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements. We know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5. 
General information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks.